Thank you for that introduction and thank you for having me here. I've never been able to do something like this before, so I'm really excited to blend my love of film and my obsession with my own research. Um, so when you watch the film today, um, I'm not going to quiz you on anything, but what I'm going to do at the end is highlight the things that the film gets right about pandemic disease and then tie it to three specific real pandemic diseases that, that have affected human populations. Um, so thank you all for coming today and I um, hope you enjoy the movie and stick around for uh, my short presentation afterwards. Thanks. Thank you all so much for st sticking around. Uh, and I'm reminded again, yes, washing your hands is very important. Um, uh, I will give the microphone to somebody who can speak a little bit more eloquently about that. Please, again, uh, welcome up Dr. Sharon DeWitt. Is anyone please? No, that's great. All right, so that was an uplifting way to spend our afternoon. Um, all right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we saw in Contagion and how it reflects reality. So Contagion is obviously a dramatic portrayal of an infectious disease pandemic, um, and it also portrays some of the outcomes that epidemic diseases can have in terms of um, human mortality, the, the sheer panic that can be produced, and also public health responses or failures thereof. Um, the disease that was featured in this movie is not real, um, but it does reflect the potential dangers of and also fears that we have about a real phenomenon that our, our species has um, dealt with throughout history, and that is the phenomenon of emerging infectious diseases. Um, so emerging diseases are, are diseases that are either brand new to human populations or um, at least newly recognized. There is some debate uh, in the field about um, what counts as new. Uh, is it only new and white? Westerners are aware of the existence of a disease, um, but that's a that we could spend a whole other lecture on that. Um, so new to some people, diseases or diseases that um, already have existed in a population but are increasing in their incidence or in their geographic distribution. Um, more than 50 diseases have emerged in recent decades or re-emerged, and so this is a Okay, everyone memorize this map really quick. Um, so this is a map um, from uh, December 2015 showing at that time diseases that were newly emerging or, or re-emerging. Um, and you'll see that there is anthrax is listed as a deliberately emerging disease because it was used in bioterrorism efforts. But we have things like um, various influenza viruses, Zika, um, Ebola, HIV, um, so a variety of different diseases have emerged or re-emerged. Um, new diseases are going to emerge or re-emerge in the future. That is inevitable. And you get sort of signs or, or um, hints of that in the movie. Um, so why are diseases emerging or re-emerging? One major factor is continued um, and increasing human encroachment into previous un previously uncultivated or, or uninhabited environments. And what this does is it, it allows for new contacts between humans and wild animals or between our livestock and wild animals. And that increases the risk of cross-species infection. Um, and it also can potentially put us into contact with free living microbes that can potentially cause human disease. Um, there, there have also been innovations in human-built environments that have caused the emergence of diseases. And an example of this is Legionnaire's disease which is caused by um, Legionella pneumophila, which proliferates in um, air conditioning systems. So this is something that was not problematic to humans prior to our innovations in HVAC. Um, other things that have, have caused the emergence of diseases are um, changes in food handling and the food industry in general. So an example of something that has emerged because of this is um, bovine spongiform encephalitis, BSE, colloquially, colloquially known <laughs> as mad cow disease. This is a prion disease um, that emerged in cattle in the UK in 1986 as a result of industrial cannibalism. So cattle were fed rendered cattle, and it caused the spread of this prion disease in UK cattle. And this led to the emergence of variant crutzfeld jakob disease in humans via the consumption of contaminated cattle. Oh, this is so... Um, Grim. <laughs> um, another um, another factor that I think of all the time is um, the very the the 
speed and ease with which we can travel around the globe. Um, and very often when I do get sick, it's because I've been on an airplane. Um, so we can travel thousands and thousands of miles during the incubation period of most infectious diseases of humans. And that allows people to travel before they're symptomatic and potentially expose other people um, thousands of miles from where they became infected. Um, overuse and misuse of antibiotics has led to the reemergence of some pathogens, including multiple drug resistant strains of tuberculosis and other diseases. So there are lots of human behaviors that are um, allowing diseases to emerge or reemerge in our populations. Now, emerging diseases cause concern in part because their newness creates uncertainty about the effects that they might have um, over the, the short term, so during an, ep an epidemic or just after, and also the longer term, so many years or even generations following an epidemic. A lot of newly emerging diseases make um, splashy headlines, they create a lot of fear, even though they don't actually kill that many people globally. Um, so we have these fears that may not be justified, but we have them because we're not sure what effects they might have because they are new. So the goal of emerging disease research is to um, learn as much as possible about the factors that favor emergence, um, understand when and where and why new diseases might um, emerge, and then, and then do as much as we can to be prepared for that emergence, potentially prevent emergence if possible, um, and deal with emerging diseases much more efficiently once they have actually emerged. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about, um, about the general characteristics of the disease in the movie that reflects real diseases. So the disease that was featured in Contagion is an example of a zoonotic infection. And um, zoonoses or zoonotic infections are caused by pathogens whose primary hosts are non-human animals, and they infect humans only incidentally. The figure that I'm showing here is from the CDC, and it is actually showing the um, transmission dynamics of bubonic plague, which is near and dear to my heart because I study it in the past. Um, and what you're seeing on the left is bubonic plague circulating as normal within a wild rodent population, squirrels. And it's being spread by their ectoparasites, which are fleas. And occasionally, squirrels will die. And if there's a certain threshold number of enough squirrels dying, um, it'll force their ectoparasites to look for blood meals elsewhere, and perhaps they will jump onto a domesticated cat or a goat or a dog or a human, and then that allows for the opportunity for a plague to spread to humans. But um, humans are not the natural host species for a plague. It's, it's other, it's actually 200 other non-human animals that act as that natural reservoir. So these zoonotic pathogens, um, they can be passed on to humans through our direct contact with infected animals and touching their um, blood, feces, urine, mucus, saliva by petting them or if they bite or scratch us. We can also come into direct contact, indirect contact if we go into an area where those animals have been or touch objects that they have touched and then the pathogen can pass to us in that way. They can also be vector-borne, as you're seeing here, um, where you have something like an insect that'll bite an infected animal and then bite a human and pass on the pathogen in that way. And they can also be food-borne, which is um, what we saw in contagion. So people can become infected if they either handle or consume the flesh or other products of animals who are infected. Um, over 60% of the roughly 1,400 species of infectious pathogens that are known to be pathogenic to humans so actually can cause disease in humans, are transmitted to us by animals. And according to the CDC, 75% of emerging infectious diseases in humans are spread from animals. So animals have a really important role in terms of being sources of disease for us. So what I'm going to do now is talk about three different zoonotic infections. Um, um, one ancient, so the Black Death of the 14th century, and two more recent, so um, the 2009-2010 swine flu pandemic and also Ebola. So starting with the Black Death, um, 
so those of you who were um, at my talk earlier today, you know that this is the disease that I have spent over 15 years studying from a bioarchaeological perspective. So I study the um, skeletal remains of people who died during the Black Death in London. And the Black Death was the first outbreak of what we commonly refer to as the second pandemic of plague. And the second pandemic started in um, the 1300s in um, Asia, probably in China, and then it spread from there across a large portion of the old world, finally reaching Europe in 1346. And then it was basically over by 1353. And then there was another outbreak um, in at least in parts of, of Europe in 1361, and then repeated outbreaks for the rest of the second pandemic, which ended at various times in different places. Um, uh, we are currently, some people would argue, in experiencing the third pandemic of plague, which began in Asia in the 1800s, and then, or, or perhaps the 1700s, and then spread throughout the entire world. So the Black Death um, was caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. This is the same bacterium that causes plague today. We know that the Black Death was caused by Yersinia pestis based on ancient DNA analyses of people who died during the Black Death. So we have DNA um, that is that we know comes from that particular pathogen. Um, and plague is and probably was at the time of the Black Death a, a zoonosis. Um, today, very often, um, plague uh, infects humans once there is an, an, an outbreak or, or an endemic plague within animals that live close to humans and then humans inc incidentally get infected. It's not yet clear how plague was originally introduced into human populations at the time of the Black Death. Very often we assume that it was spread by rats and fleas, but we don't actually know that. So there's a lot of work being done now, including mathematical modeling, to try to really um, determine what animals other than humans were involved in the spread of the Black Death. And there's some evidence that, that um, maybe the human louse might have been involved. So not even fleas, a, a human lice. So in Europe alone, the Black Death between 1346 and 1353 killed tens of millions of people. Um, so some places lost um, 30 to 60 percent. There are some places, Florence, for example, that lost 75 percent, and some places that lost even higher proportions of their populations. Um, this is very, very high mortality. So in Contagion, we heard a couple of times during the movie that the mortality rate of the disease was, initially they said it was in the, in the low 20s, and then at one point they said it was upwards of 30%. What they were referring to in the movie is um, of the people who were infected with, with, that, with that virus, that was the percentage that died from the disease. When I say that 30 to 60% of people in Europe died during the Black Death, that's the overall, of the overall people alive at the time, 30 to 60% died, not 30 to 60% of people infected. Presumably a much higher proportion of people who were infected died during the Black Death. Um, so really, really high mortality, regardless of how you look at it. Um, this very high mortality during the Black Death, it totally interrupted many um, um, facets of life, including normal burial practices. And what you're looking at on the left side is a one small portion of a mass burial trench that was used during the Black Death in London. These mass burial trenches are fascinating for a variety of reasons. Um, one of those reasons is if I were to describe to um, a medieval archaeologist just one individual in a burial trench they would think, oh, that's a standard medieval Christian burial. So they're all stretched out with their heads oriented west and their feet oriented east, wrapped in a shroud. Um, if I would then show them the picture or say they were in a trench, they would realize, oh, that's not typical. Um, but the, the fact remains that these bodies were treated very, very carefully, even under these catastrophic conditions. But this is an unusual burial. Having hundreds of bodies uh, lined up and stacked on top of each other in a mass grave is not how burials were typically done during the medieval period. Usually there it would be one body per grave. Um, and we saw that in the, in, in the movie Contagion, the, the ne necessity to use mass burials because normal burial practices simply could not keep up with the number of deaths that were occurring. 
Um, I, by studying people who died during the Black Death, I have found evidence that people varied in their risk of death during the Black Death, and we saw there was variation in people who were dying from the disease and contagion. And so they mentioned things like health status and um, and social status or, or wealth. Those things were affecting people's risks. Um, and uh, even though people often assume that the Black Death was an indiscriminate killer, there is evidence that older adults were at higher risk, unhealthy people faced higher risks. From documentary evidence, we have some evidence that richer people might have fared better than poorer people. Um, so there definitely was variation in risk. Something else that happened during the Black Death was the development and refinement of the quarantine measures that we continue to use today and that you saw in contagion. And those quarantine measures include isolating the sick and isolating people who had been exposed to people who had been sick or died. Um, what you're looking at at the um, bottom there is a, um, a lazaretto, so it's a plague hospital. Um, and these were first used, um, there were temporary plague hospitals established in Italy and Croatia, and then permanent plague quarantine hospitals were in use in Italy, and then these practices spread to other parts of Europe. Um, the word quarantine comes from the Italian meaning 40, so people were quarantined for 40 days. And this was at a time before people understood disease transmission dynamics. They didn't understand, they didn't know about microorganisms. They thought that the Black Death was spread by noxious vapors. They didn't actually understand disease tra transmission dynamics. So it's really incredible that they developed these methods that were effective at preventing the spread of disease across space. It might have had the, and almost certainly had the effect of elevating mortality levels locally, but at least containing mortality to relatively small areas. Um, following the initial Black Death. All right, moving on to a more recent epidemic or pandemic, um, and that's the 2009-2010 swine flu pandemic. This was caused by an H1N1 influenza A virus, and it is another example of a zoonotic infection. Now, in general, we get pandemics of influenza when there is genetic reassortment among different uh, strains of the virus or viruses. And what that um, reassortment does is it's a shuffling together of the genetic material from different strains, and it produces a novel strain with antigens that have never been seen by humans before, and that can cause a pandemic. And this process of genetic reassortment occurs when a single host cell is simultaneously infected by two or more influenza strains, and that occurs in what we call a mixing vessel. Very often that mixing vessel is a pig, and those pigs are mixing vessels because they're in contact with birds that have flu and humans that have flu, and the pigs themselves have flu, so that creates this perfect opportunity from influenza's perspective for this reassortment to occur and give rise to a brand new strain that can cause pandemics. Um, so the H1N1 flu pandemic occurred um, when a, an, a, an existing triple reassortment of pig, human, and bird flu then further reassorted with another pig flu strain, and it created this novel strain that had never been seen before, um, and it created a pandemic that a th the official tally of deaths is over 18,000, but this is almost certainly a vast underestimate of the true number of deaths. Um, the World Health Organization does estimate that it, the real death toll might have been um, 10 times higher than that. And that's a, a recent pandemic where we, we have people infected in areas with what we would consider to be good medical care, and it still did cause a lot of deaths. So in Contagion, those last scenes of the movie reference this mixing vessel phenomenon. So you had a bat, which was presumably infected with a bat virus, and the bat ate something and dropped some food near a pig. Presumably the virus was on that food, and then a pig ate it, and then there was probably a reassortment within the pig of the pig and bat virus. And then you had the chef preparing the pig, wiping his hands, unhygienically um, before meeting Gwyneth Paltrow, and then the, what we see is that human-to-human -human transmission, and then it was established within a human host, and then it could spread human-to-human. -human. Um, and then lastly, 
an even more recent pandemic was, or epidemic, um, was the 2014-2016 epidemic of Ebola. And Ebola is caused by the Ebola virus. Fruit bats are thought to be the, the natural um, reservoir of Ebola virus. And humans can be infected with Ebola if they come into contact with infected animals or other humans. The first outbreaks of Ebola were, recor were recorded in 1976 in Sudan and Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and there have been periodic outbreaks and isolated cases of Ebola since then. Case fatality rates with Ebola are very high. They range from 37% to 90%. So again, of the people infected, huge numbers of them die. The 2014-2016 Ebola epidemic was extraordinarily large compared to all other previous epidemics. Um, it, was, it was actually larger than all of those previous epidemics and outbreaks and isolated cases of Ebola combined. Um, so in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, um, there were 28,000 cases and 11,000 deaths. And then there was a handful of cases and deaths in other countries in Africa, as well as in Europe, and um, a few cases and two deaths in the United States. Um, this did generate a lot of fear, and, and you can make the argument that there was a motivation to actually do something proactive because the Western world was perceived to be threatened. And part of the response, um, beginning in 2014, was planning for a vaccine. So there was a vaccine development team that was comprised of clinicians and um, researchers from the U.S. and from Liberia. Vaccine candidates were identified, and then they were tested in 2015 in Monrovia. So there are two vaccine candidates, and all most of the people who receive those vaccine candidates produced antibodies against Ebola, um, and there don't seem to be severe side effects. It is now 2019, and those vaccines have not yet been fully licensed for human um, for for use for everybody. Um, so. Vaccine development typically occurs much more slowly than what we saw in contagion, because we don't have some heroic fool <laughs> injecting themselves with a, with a, um, a vaccine. So the, the vaccines are not yet fully licensed for use, but they have been licensed for compassionate use. And what that means is they are used um, for people they're given to people whose, whose loved ones' close contacts have become sick or who have died from Ebola, and then just this week, um, there are reports that they have um, approved it for compassionate use for pregnant women. So they had been excluded previously, but they're now uh, able to get the vaccination. So hopefully this vaccine, the either or both of those vaccines will be fully licensed, um, and that will potentially prevent num um, a large number of deaths in the future. There is an ongoing epidemic in, um, uh, in, in, um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo currently, um, and when I looked a few weeks ago, um, at that point there were 800, 800 confirmed cases and 400 deaths, and certainly that number has increased since then. So there really is a need to, um, to approve those vaccines for general use. I'm going to end with what I think is good news. <laughs> okay, so what do we do in the face of these potential or, or actual threats? Well, we spend money. We spend a lot of money. Um, so a report came out following the 2014-2017 Ebola epidemic by Moon et al. And what they did was they argued that um, one of the most effective things emerging diseases is improved surveillance and reporting capacities worldwide. Now, in order to ensure sufficient surveillance and reporting cap capacities worldwide, it would cost about $3.4 billion annually. Which is expensive. Some, I mean, some people might think that's expensive. Um, however, it is a fraction of the estimated 60 billion to 570 billion dollars that's lost globally each year because of epidemic and pandemic disease. So it is a, a big investment that would mostly have to come from high-income countries to aid lower-income countries. But it's certainly worth it in the long terms, even if all you care about is economics. If you care about human life. Definitely worth it. Um, and then in general, I think it's really important to raise public awareness about the need to be prepared and the need to push our representatives and government to, f to support funding for disease research. Um, I certainly, when people watch movies like Contagion, I don't want them to be afraid that what they saw is, is inevitable um, in, in the future. I want people to be 
you and all your friends, um, to be aware that there actually are steps that we can take to be better prepared and to respond more efficiently. Um, so thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, it sounded like the other animals were typical reservoirs for all these nasty epidemics. Are, are there common examples of uh, diseases that humans are the natural reservoirs? Like with the common cold do you this, something like that? Or? So the question is, are there diseases that humans are the natural host rather than non-human animals. Um, so we had a, a talk earlier today that smallpox, which has been eradicated through vaccination campaigns, that was specific to humans. Um, there are definitely, all I can think of are, are animal. Um, it's not my fault, it's because 61%. Yes, Drew, please help. <laughs> Did we? There's debate about that, but you're on the side of, yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. So, okay, so we're, we're, we're going to defer to, to his, his expertise, although there's debate. So, or, so, so, um, so, mycobacterium tuberculosis infects humans. It's closely related to mycobacterium bovis. Bovis? Bovine? Bovis. Oh, whatever. Close enough. Um, and it used to be thought that because of the close relationship and the fact that humans domesticated cattle, that it must have been that human tuberculosis evolved from um, cow tuberculosis after domestication. But genetic analyses have suggested that um, that Mycobacterium bovis, bovis is descended from human tuberculosis. Cool. Any others? Yeah. Okay. There are. There definitely are. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, on your map of Europe, mm -hmm. are there green areas, I guess, that the spread never infected? Yeah, so, yeah, so the question is, this map of the spread of the Black Death, there are areas where that did escape infection. What did Milan do differently? Oh, they prayed harder. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, I'm, I don't know for sure about Milan, but, but some of the areas that did escape either escaped totally from infection or where mortality was lower um, tend to be places that were less accessible, particularly by pilgrims and, and merchants. Um, so this is an indication that this really was spread either directly by humans or by commensal animals that, that, or, or domesticated animals. Um, but it's, it's a, a, a question that would best be answered if we knew how the disease was transmitted. Yeah. Uh, we saw in the movie about kind of the danger of fear and paranoia yes. and panicking. Mm -hmm. Can you speak kind of in your experience about historically fear and panic mm -hmm. and how they might even cause disease to spread faster? Yeah, so the, the comment is about the fear that was um, that was shown in the movie and, and what effects that might have and parallels in the past. Um, some, some really unfortunate parallels with the Black Death. Um, there was a lot of scapegoating um, because people didn't, I mean, even if people do understand disease transmission dynamics, that doesn't mean they're not gonna blame certain individuals for the spread of disease. But at the at the time of the Black Death, people um, pointed to, to already marginalized groups as being responsible for the introduction or spread of, of the Black Death. So there was persecution of Jews, there was persecution of people of Roma descent. Um, so, so there, uh, so there were these really negative responses in terms of blaming and then actually killing or, or at least driving away people that were um, deemed responsible. Um, at the time of the Black Death, people were aware that the only way they could prevent becoming infected is if they were to flee from areas where the plague had arrived or where it was on its way. And that if people were infected, particularly if they were infected prior to exhibiting symptoms, that fleeing to uninfected areas could have then brought the infection. So, um, so yes. Uh, in, in terms of how do how do we actually combat that? Um, having people really understand how do disease spread and what are what are some fairly simple things that we can do to prevent infection, and and 
as I mentioned, Lumi, stop touching your face. I have a, I, I bite my nails. I'm, I'm almost 43 and I'm like, I guess I'm just doing this until I'm dead. Um, so I'd really try hard not to, but I just find myself doing it without thought. And that all I'm doing is just introducing pathogens to my mucous membranes. And it's the stupidest thing to do. Um, but we are, we do these compulsive things and all we're doing is just um, putting ourselves at risk. So just basic hygiene and, and, and prevention um, is, is key. Yeah. I wonder about the long lead time from finding a vaccine uh -huh. and being able to use it. Mm -hmm. And is that partly based on not wanting to take the risk of making a mistake? Yes. Is there a way to use the stuff if you change the requirements? Yeah, if we're willing to accept higher risk, yes, we could speed it up. But that's a really hard argument to make. So the question is about facts, the, 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 the perceived slowness of vaccine development. Um, so, so some of the things that we have to worry about when it comes to vaccines, um, they mention it in the movie. If you're using a live attenuated virus, for example, we have to be very careful that the, that, that live attenuated is not going to revert to the wild type that's unattenuated. Um, we also have to be very careful about uh, short-term and longer-term side effects. And the only way to assess side effects over the long term is to wait a long time in clinical trials. Um, this is the this is the trade-off that they're making right now with the Ebola vaccinations, is they don't know the long-term side effects, but they know the vaccines are are effective and therefore they're willing to take the risk that people who are at highest risk of infection will be protected but potentially will suffer poor outcomes later. Um, yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm wondering if, if you know if the meat industry is still using antibiotics frivolously in order to fatten animals up faster than so on. So the question about overuse of antibiotics in the food industry shocked if they weren't. So, and I heard of they are. Is it a, based on data? Yes, yes. <laughs> no. No, no. Yeah. How could the virus cause, I mean, a vaccine cause side effects 10, 20 years later? Oh, so many ways. Yeah. <laughs> so many ways. You don't even understand why. Or no, do it. <laughs> <laughs> what she said. <laughs> I mean, it's called unforeseen outcomes. I'm just working with other people. Oh. I mean, why would it take that long to show up? Molecular genetics, which I can't explain, but. Mm. Yeah, and that, those are the vaccines that we and get to use. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems like ticks are an important factor for various diseases. Did you say ticks? Ticks. ticks. Ticks are, yes. There are, there are several diseases that they're involved in. And lo lots of ectoparasites, so insects that are feeding off the external surface of, a, of an animal. They are they play a huge important role in disease transmission. I, uh, I just I want to put a plug in for um, Hans on this is which I really love. Yes, 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 yes. Yep. And my understanding is they hardly ever get yeah, no, no, possums are wonderful, um, beautiful, sweet little, they are. They're, just Google image search possums and then limit that search to people who like them. They're, they're great. Um, yeah, so they, they, are, they play a really important role in, the, in reducing tick populations. Um, bats, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, some diseases are spread from, but bats in general um, play a really important role in reducing mosquito populations, and mosquito play a role in transmission of lots of diseases that are terrifying. Um, so I encourage you all to build bat boxes to encourage bats to roost near your house and enjoy their sweet little flights. Yeah. Um, so this is science on film. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, do you think that the movie was like an accurate portrayal? I mean, of course they had to gloss over yeah. certain things. Were there any, was there anything that was like, oh, that's completely dead on and correct? And conversely, like, oh, there's no way that could be. So I, there, there are things I like about this movie. It's like, <laughs> 
the thing about fomites, I don't know if anyone noticed that, but she said, oh, this, these are actus fomites. What is a fomite? And then she, so there's, it's like, here are the definitions of key terms that I really like, um, the, the, the description of are not. Um, so, so there's a lot that's right about the movie, the, the, um, how quickly things progress and break down, perhaps not realistic. Um, but, but I think on the, on the whole, there's a lot that's, that is accurate. Um, and, and, and the vaccine development, the part, the speediness of that, it's clear to the audience, that's not how things typically occur. I guarantee you, we don't have vaccine developers all just like, taking one for the team, let's see if I get this deadly virus. So, so I, but I think that's probably fairly clear to an audience. Um, and if not, well, it's not an audience of naive um, immunologists, so I don't think we're encouraging them to all start doing that. Yeah. Oh, we did. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, West Nile virus is still around. Um, Mosquito-borne, uh, and that is a, a relatively new emerging, well, <laughs> new to white people here, uh, emerging disease. Um, so um, I don't actually know much more about West Nile virus, but it still is present. Bats eat, bats eat mosquitoes, right? Bats eat mosquitoes. Get your bats on. <laughs> yeah, and your bug spray, and your protective clothing and check each other for ticks. <laughs> <laughs>